Welcome to the Defense and Aerospace Report. I'm Vago Maradian at the Navy League's annual Sea Air Space Conference and Trade Show just outside Washington, D.C. and National Harbor. And we have with us Dan Gillian, who is uh, the uh, Vice President for F-18 Programs at the Boeing Company. Uh, sir, thanks very much for uh, spending a little time with us. Sure, glad to be here. Thanks. I, I want to start off. Obviously, uh, there's the, the competition as it's billed. Uh, President Trump was looking to sort of play uh, the F-18 and the F-35 off against, against one another. Um, obviously, there is an assessment that's ongoing. What are some of the things you guys have submitted to the Pentagon as part of that assessment process? So we've been working with the Navy for years and certainly have supported the administration's request to talk about the right number and the right capabilities for airplanes to have, for the Super Hornet to have because it's going to fly in the carrier air wings out into the 2040s. So in order to do that, the Navy has to have the right number of airplanes, and certainly we see uh, ongoing production of Super Hornets as part of that solution. And you have to have the right capabilities in the carrier air wings in a complementary way, given that F-35, Growler, E-2D will all be there. The question we've been working to answer is, what does the Super Hornet need to bring to the fight? We think we put that together in what we call the Block 3 Super Hornet, uh, based on what we've done with the Block 2 and the established flight plan we have for things like radar and an infrared search and track sensor. Block 3 brings conformal fuel tanks uh, to extend the range of the platform. It brings uh, a little bit of stealth. It brings a big computer and a big data pipe so we can move data around the carrier air wing. Uh, and we think it could be a 9,000 hour airplane off the line, which helps buy future readiness for the carrier air wing. How are you guys getting to a 9,000 hour uh, airplane? You know, what are some of the things to, to stretch it? Because I think the base model aircraft is, a, is now a 6,000 hour aircraft. 6, hours. What are some of the things you guys are doing to do that sort of life extension, reducing obviously through life maintenance on the product? There's a couple of steps. We've been working with the Navy for the last few years on the service life assessment program, which is the engineering work to understand what needs to change to go from six to 9,000 hours. We're still doing that, but we've got a lot of it behind us, and we know what the plane, what needs to change in the plane to last 9,000 hours. Uh, we've done some early learning by bringing in a few airplanes to look at things like material condition and corrosion and understand how we're going to implement the change package to move from six to 9,000 hours. Um, and now we're getting ready through you know, standing up new facilities, uh, buying parts, getting engineers in place to start doing the work to extend from six to 9,000 hours as the first airplane is going to hit 6,000 hours sometime early next year. When you guys are looking at this new aircraft, though, how much money is it going to cost to develop? Is that something you guys are funding or you're looking at the Navy to come up with money for that Block 3 aircraft? So the Block 3 uh, leverages, like I said, some existing flight plan things that are funded, and we've put together the, uh, the additional packages uh, of those five things I talked about. We're working with the Navy on how to fund those. There's lots of different ways to, to go do that. At the end of the day, we think the difference between a Block 2 and a Block 3 is just a couple million dollars. And so if you're going to be buying additional airplanes to solve the, the carrier wing capacity problem, why not make those Block 3s and bring on the new capability? Do you, right now, all eyes are on the budget. Obviously, the Navy's been talking about a strike fighter shortfall for some time. That's not a new thing that's been discussed. And in fact, it's one of the things that's been fueling purchases of the aircraft now for a few years. What are the implications of a budgetary stalemate, a full long, year long CR on you know, this program and including a concern that's shared by many at this show that the massive budget increases that were expected may not materialize, forcing the services to make some very, very hard calls and hard choices uh, within them. How does that budgetary dynamic potentially affect the program as it stands now? Well, we've certainly been very appreciative of all the help Congress has brought to the Navy and the program over the last couple of years to fund additional airplanes. Uh, in 2017, we see the support for Super Hornet both in the Navy and with Congress being very strong because of the shortfall that has been talked about. Um, and obviously everybody wants to see budget stability and to see this come to fruition, but we feel we have great support for the program and for the compelling need to buy additional airplanes and to bring on advanced capabilities so that the carrier wing has that right mix uh, going forward for the next 25 years. How much production life is in the program right now before you get any one of those Block 3 aircraft? What's in the pipeline now? And, and what's, what are your overseas opportunities you're pursuing? Because obviously those overseas orders are what help prolong the life and then the Navy came in at these right intervals, you know, sure. you, you, had, you had these sort of saving moments where you got these international orders that sort of stretched the life of the line out. So on contract today through the middle of 2018 at a production rate of two per month. If you look at the Navy's FY17 budget with airplanes in 17 and 18, the Kuwait sale and the uh, work we're doing with Canada on their interim buy, that takes production out into the early 20s. And then the ongoing uh, U.S. Navy production coupled with campaigns in Finland, uh, uh, Belgium recently released an RFP, uh, ongoing discussions in India, 
um, those things will help take it out further through the next decade. And how many international orders are you guys programming? How many international orders do you think you guys will land, say, in the next five to ten years that you guys are programming or expecting? Uh, our focus is on addressing customer needs. So the Navy needs additional airplanes with increased capability, and we're working with those international customers to understand their needs and make sure that we have the right offering available for them and we can deliver it on time, on cost, which is our track record. We've never missed a delivery. We've been on cost uh, throughout the program. So not so much about programming them in as working with them to make sure we understand their needs and we can deliver what they need on time. And let me ask you one last question. I mean, obviously, when uh, the president put that tweet of a comparable F-18, you know, there were a lot of those in the aviation world who said, look, they're, they're not comparable. You know, as you look at somebody who's an airplane person, your entire career has been an airplane person, um, you know, what, what, are, what are the things you think you do well? What are the things they do well? And how do these two aircraft, the F-35 and the F-18, complement one another? And why is it not a binary choice as far as you're concerned? Carrier wing needs both platforms. There are certain missions where you want a higher level of stealth that F-35 brings, uh, and, and they do that really well. There are a lot of missions where you want to bring uh, weapons at range in large quantities, where you need that long-range air-to-air infrared search and track sensor. That's something that we do really well, and they work together. In some missions, in many cases, you can pick either platform based on what you have available in the carrier wing. Uh, we certainly think that we are a very cost-effective airplane to operate, and that factors into things like budgets over time as well. So we, we do think the planes work together. They have some things that are truly different that complement, and they have some things that are the same, like range um, and data fusion, which allows the carrier air wing commanders to have mission flexibility. So complementary really can go two ways. In terms of all the subsystems and everything to get the aircraft to communicate to get to, uh, with one another, just to bring our audience up to speed, what are some of the things you guys are doing to make sure that all of these, both of these airplanes and all of the airplanes from an alliance standpoint, but particularly the JSF and the F-35, are all on the same page when it comes to connectivity and communications. Sure, all platforms in the carrier wing have Link 16 in them, including F-35. E2D Growler and what we're proposing with the Block 3 Super Hornet will have something called TTNT, Tactical Targeting Network Technology, which is a bigger data pipe. And then how we plug F-35 in there over time, that's, that's something that the, the Navy and industry will have to work through. Dan, thanks very much for spending time with us. We really appreciate it and best of luck with the program. Thank you very much.